and welcome to the Property Unleashed with me, Mark Fitzgerald. And today I am joined by a special guest. I have a Jackie Toms joining me. Good to see you, Jackie. How are you? Yeah, I'm great, Mark. Really nice to be back chatting with you again. Very excited. Yeah, yeah. No, it's brilliant. We had a good chat uh, recently in the Pink Community where we did a live together and I enjoyed it so much that it's been an honour to be able to get Jackie back onto the podcast so we can talk a bit longer because Jackie has a good story to tell and I'll let her tell it. She'll tell it a lot better than me. But, you know, her background was she worked very, very hard for, you know, 18 odd months to save up and buy a flat then realized that that's not the most proactive way of doing things. In turn, then she started working with investors. She built up and bought 10 properties over 12 months doing so. And now with a business partner and her husband, uh, they focus on purchasing and doing up blocks of flats and all sorts of units and things. But that's a high level overview from my good self. If you are really good, Mark. (laughs) No, it's um, you've uh, you summarized it really well there. We've kind of been through the the journey of like doing stuff ourselves, figuring out how to work with investors and then how to bring on the team. And yeah, and now we we, we purely work with investors. Uh, we focus in Kent buying blocks of flats. We do buy, refurbish, uh, refinance. We kind of do a slightly longer uh, process for that really over about 12 to 18 months we take to go from purchase to go through to refinance. Uh, that's been since COVID that that's really changed. Um, so yeah, that's our like main like property model, which we can talk more about. And then that's kind of like spin the springboard for other businesses too. So we, we help other investors. So it's been like me and my husband just feel really cool to help people. It's been something that's always been the case. So we've essentially taken what we've done in our property business, put a structure around it, put a process around it, which is like, I'm a bit of a nerd for, uh, and then we help other investors to raise finance and do deals to essentially get them on the route to being able to have a property business that enables them them to travel so it's um yeah it's um it's been a hell of a journey and I think I really enjoyed our chat last time because it's yeah it sounds all like glossy and nice but it's actually been some really tough parts of that journey along the way so um yeah I'm sure we'll get on to that well, that's it. I mean, it is a journey and it has its ups and downs with anything. Uh, it's very easy to get caught up, as we always say, with seeing how, you know, I've done this development, I've done that development and the GDB was this and all of that. But you don't always know the blood, sweat and tears. And I always say plenty of tears that goes into, you know, these operations. Nothing ever runs smoothly, particularly in the property world and things. But let's just, if you don't mind, just go back. Obviously, you, you saved. So you knew that getting into property was a good idea. You wanted to get a property portfolio earlier built up as I say you you did a lot of this while still working a full-time job so you did have to systemize your business you did have to get it sort of working without you in it all the time because um you know obviously you wanted to keep the bills on or you had your own reasons for that so you know if you take yourself back to those stages what 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 was it what was it like for you basically you know working a full-time job trying to buy these properties trying to work with investors it was God, it's like, it's so hard to like take myself back to that. Like, it just feels like a different lifetime almost. But I guess at first it was like a whole other world started to open up when I started to like read these books. And I'm like, oh my God, like, you know, I'm just, you know, just working a full-time job. And there's all this other stuff that you can do. Obviously read the rich dad, poor dad. You're like, oh my God, assets, cash flow. Oh my God, didn't even know this was all a thing. And like, I think it, at first it's just such a like, mind opening mind boggling moment that you're like gosh there's so much more to life that I didn't understand so from that perspective it was like an incredibly exciting time I can remember like being on my commute to work I'd have my like power cheesy pop music in my like headphones and be like walking to work being like oh my god like I see the world with different eyes and it was um really exciting and I think that like kind of excitement does keep you definitely like kept me going for a period of time but I think ultimately I kind of you, you get quite wired right like you're working full time every time you have like a break or a lunch break you're juggling like phone calls you're going to viewings in the evenings you're getting up early to analyze deals like it is full on so like totally unsustainable but you almost don't realize you kind of get swept up in the excitement for a period of time and that did probably carry me forward for maybe like two and a half years two to two and a half years of like buzzing energy excitement because you kind of find out more and more like learning how to work with investors like progressive um we learned some stuff from like rob moore and he sort of really catapulted us forward in terms of like how our belief in ourselves to do that 
which was great. Um, but then it's, you, can, you can only kind of live on fumes for so long. And that did ultimately then lead to what was like the first moment of burnout, really. Um, so, yeah, kind of wired, I guess, would be the one word to describe that first phase. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's so exciting. I do say to a lot of people, a lot of my students and clients as well, is, you know, while you've got the momentum, go for it. But just start to look for the signs that all of a sudden, you know, your, your love affair with property and getting involved and building a portfolio, things will start to wane. And if you start to find yourself a bit snappy and things, you do need to take a break. You do need to switch off. And I found it myself because, you know, every time I could do something, I was driving, I was walking, I was doing anything. I'd have my headphones in. I'd be listening to podcasts, audio books, everything. I was just thinking I was a sponge. But at some point now, I actually love just to switch everything off not have anything on me and just go for a walk and just be with your thoughts and things because you can burn yourself out very, and you can put yourself into a very dark place as well. Can't you? It all seems so good. And you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm, I'm doing well. I'm getting these deals over. I'm working with investors. I'm growing the business. I want, why do I feel so down? Why am I, you know, you start doubting yourself massively. Don't you? Did you find that? Definitely. Yeah. It was like, and the funny thing is it kind of comes out of nowhere. Cause I think you're so hooked up on adrenaline because you are doing too much and working too much and it's kind of like a necessary evil for a period of time but then you kind of get addicted to doing it without actually realizing that's what's happening and so yeah for me I totally just fell off a cliff basically one day I was pumping all cylinders and then I turned up at a networking event and like someone who become a really good friend in property was like Jackie hey how are you doing and I just burst into tears. <laughs> like, I didn't realise how like not okay I was. And I'd got my like suitcase that I was just constantly travelling around because I was always travelling around the place, meeting investors, going to networking events. I started to speak at events and stuff as well. Like it was really intense. And yeah, suddenly you go from being on like top of the world to suddenly being like, God, I, I hate property. Like what, what am I doing? Like actually a full-time job suddenly felt like a really easy alternative option. And it's also that really crappy part of the process where you're like, you're working so hard 24 seven. Like you really, I worked probably yeah 18 months to buy one property, which, you know, when you think about that and then you're like, okay, I'm getting a few hundred pounds a month cash flow. It sounds pretty crap when you just look at that part of it, but you've got to realize like that you're ultimately now I'm getting paid back for all of that work in terms of like ratio of hours versus results. But at that time it is the worst part because you work so hard but what ultimately you get out of it and I think that just really yeah really caught up with me and I just remember like lying on the sofa just like in yeah just really sad and upset and questioning if I was making the right decision um yeah it was quite a dark place um but ultimately I think I can now see like we've had enough of times like that along the way that I now can see that those moments of darkness and sadness and overwhelm have actually been the most important moments and the best stuff has come out of them. So for me, um, I was very active on social media, sort of sharing the journey and what we're doing. And someone who I was kind of connected with loosely was kind of seeing my like level of posting. And he was like, oh, I can see it. The burnout's coming. She's like at another networking event for like the fifth night in a week. Like this isn't sustainable. Um, and then my post started to get, maybe I, I can't remember what exactly changed, but he noticed something had shifted. And he was like, a bit of a guardian angel at that time, a guy called Elliot Kay. And he reached out and he um, was like, do you want to go for a, want to go for a drink? Basically he ended up living really close to me. And he was like, why, so what, why are you, why are you doing all of this? And again, burst into tears. Maybe it's different for men, but this is for me. Like it, it always, the tears come out of these moments. Burst into tears. He's like, why, why are you investing in property? And I was like, because I want to have more time. Like I want to, I want to go on holiday and have a nice time. And he was like, how's that going? And I was like, it's terrible. I can't remember the last time I even like sat down and painted my nails. Like that's how like no time I have for anything else and and that led to ended up we ended up working with him uh, he was our first business coach he wasn't a property investor but he just brought like business principles into our thinking and reconnect us with our vision and our purpose uh, and it was the first time that Dave came and we had those conversations together too because it was me I was out going to like the networking events and doing property mentoring without Dave but it was the first time we sat down together and said okay like, why are we doing that and what does that specifically look like for us and it was him that really asked us the right questions to get us to realize it was we wanted to go on holiday every six weeks. And how are we going to make that happen? Because what we were doing at that point was not going to lead us there. That's for sure. 
No, I, I, I'm, I completely resonate with that. I mean, the, the tears do come for us all at the end of the day. But I remember being confused with myself, just thinking things are going well. Everybody keeps telling me you're crushing it. You're doing really well. But I just didn't feel it. And I, I just kept saying to myself, who am I to be doing this? You know, uh, you know, the, the bubble's going to burst. This can't be, you know, sustained doing deals and things. And what I actually found is, uh, and you say, you, you actually learn a lot about yourself is, in my own head, when I start to either think of an argument or have an argument with myself, and this might just be me, uh, I know that I need a rest because I'm quite a po positive person. I put spins on things. I'm always trying to look for solutions when there's problems and things. But if all of a sudden I start thinking I've got to have a conversation with somebody tomorrow and I start having that conversation in my head and it turns into an argument, I think to myself, Mark, you need to have a minute here because you're tired. Uh, and that's sort of my signs to know when I need to step back. Have you, have you sort of noticed that in yourself now? You know when there's sort of times where you think, hold on, hold on, close the laptop down. I need to switch off today. Yeah, definitely. I think that's really great. Like you're right, you kind of notice your what your like red flags are, right? I think um yeah, for me it's just this like that wiredness, like the brain is always going. Probably you're right, maybe the more judgmental side of myself does come out. I think there's a similarity there. I think yeah, that just that general self-awareness and for me it just keeps getting deeper. Like me and my Dave are very much into meditation now which has been over the last like two three years that that's kind of happened and that space in our morning which like I remember Elliot when we first started working with him he was meditating and I was like I don't have time for meditation in my day I'm like too busy and then I read a uh, quote I think it was a Gandhi quote the other day that he was like I have the, a very busy day today so therefore I must meditate for twice as long and like I can now totally get that because it it stops me from getting to that place because it just heightens my self-awareness of myself and how I'm feeling and quite often like things that are well, things that drive us don't necessarily come from a good place and that's definitely something that I've kind of realized going through this process to becoming more self-aware doing things like meditation has made me realize that actually like I have achieved you know people look from the outside kind of like you're saying oh it's you know you're really successful you've done all this stuff that I want to do but when I look into why I've done all of that, actually that striving and that achievement has come from a really negative place within myself, which says that I'm not good enough and that I have to do all this stuff in, in order to be valid. Yeah. <clears throat> and so that, that for me, that realization has started to unhook that kind of like negative pattern of, of where that's come from. Cause there's a deeper place where it's just like, I know that I'm, I'm good enough and I can just do all of this for fun not because I'm trying to prove anything to anyone or what I, or that I mind what anyone else thinks, just because this is like something great to do. And that for me is just like liberated a whole new level of energy, really just fun and energy and like amazing stuff is just coming to me that wouldn't have come to me before because really it was a negative underlying driver rather than a positive one. That's a bit of a sidebar, but I think it's um, an interesting uh, exploration no, I, to discuss. I think it's brilliant. I think it's brilliant. See, I'm a massive believer in meditation and I've struggled with it for years years and years and I still struggle with it now and I think I probably always will and it's like one of those oh, I'm a bit too busy today to do the meditation but it was even actually Monday this week uh, I had a few worries a few things just going off in my head that were just thoughts you know I always say the days of the week are the days of the week they are exactly the same we obviously label them but a Monday everybody says oh, I hate Mondays there's nothing to hate about Mondays it's just because it's the beginning of the week you don't hate Mondays you hate what you have to do that week so put your spin on it and start looking at things that you enjoy doing. But my meditation myself is I knew for a fact that I did a bit of exercise and things. And I thought I definitely got to sit down, concentrate, do a bit of extra meditation this morning, get my mindset right. And it completely does. I get clarity afterwards uh, and after and it really, really does help me. So if, even if it's just five minutes of breathing. I think my, my brain goes at a million miles an hour and I'm one of these people that I'm always trying to do the next thing before I finish the first thing. So I have to be very focused. Um, but by having that bit of mind, a uh, bit of meditation, I think just calming things down, slowing things down. I really do feel that it helps me then attack the day. Um, and and I, yeah, I totally resonate with that. I also think that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm also quite big on the law of attraction. I think if you if you talk it into existence, if you envision yourself doing it, and it's something that you're passionate about and it is what you want to do, it will it will find you as long as you are looking for it and as long as you take the relevant action steps to make it happen. And I think like you're, you, 
you and your husband want to travel around. You, you, you're in your motor home now. If you can't see uh, Jackie, she's in her motor home now. She's always in her motor home. Last time we spoke to her, she was in. But last time I think she was traveling around Europe. This time she's she's not in anywhere as glamorous as France and stuff like that. But um, it's it's brilliant because this is what you've obviously the both of you have envisioned, been passionate about, and you've made it happen. Mm, I think it's um, that idea that I couldn't truly appreciate before that you have to be able to ima- you have to be able to imagine something before it is able to happen. Um, like that's what what we think about is what happens in our lives. So therefore, if you can't you can't imagine how what things are going to be like, they won't be like that. And I actually. It was I did it was happening by accident, but I alluded to that like walking to the station when I was working full time and listening to cheesy music and just feeling excited about life. And I think that's actually it was really important because I was just like in my mind, I had the portfolio, like this was happening. Like it was just I had the portfolio, I had this freedom, like it was just I could just see it all and how it was all gonna happen before it happened. And I didn't that was just a natural thing. And I think it was interesting because once I got into property full time, I lost that commuting time. So I stopped having that kind of visioning time that I was accidentally doing. And it definitely did have an effect because I feel like we got into like a more of a rhythm and a comfort zone with it where it was kind of got a bit harder to do the next phase because I wasn't spending that time to to envision it. Um, so I think that's really important. And I think well, for me, the biggest revelation of the last couple of years is this thing that we choose how we feel like yeah. I always thought and this is Joe Dispenza um at Supernatural if you haven't read it it is amazing um his his whole approach to basically realizing that we think the external world makes us feel a certain way but actually we choose to react to the to the world in that way and we choose particular feelings but the problem is it's so subconscious we don't even realize we're doing it and our bodies actually get addicted to reacting to things in that way. So in the same way you can be addicted to alcohol, you can be addicted to like worry. It sounds mm-hmm. stupid, but it's it's true. And it's definitely been relevant for me. Um, and so actually choosing that, actually, I'm the one that's in control of how I react. Yeah, I'm going to get a down valve. Yeah, build costs are going to go over. All this crap is going to happen, but I don't have to feel guilty about it or worry about it or beat myself up doesn't mean I don't care like I can care without worry and I think a lot of us connect those dots where we're like if I'm not anxious and worrying I'm being uh, irresponsible or careless but it's not true like they're two completely separate things and breaking that apart and for me saying no matter what crap is going on around it's always going to be there and I can still feel great. And actually by doing that, and that's what I practice in my meditations is how I want to feel and being intentional about that. That actually the funny thing is there's so many more options available to us in terms of the choices that we make. But when we're in worry, anxiety and guilt, all we can see is like a horse with those like blinker things on. All you can see is like the tunnel vision. It's like you're in the fight or flight response and your bandwidth for opportunities and creativity really closes so for me being far more intentional about how I want to feel practicing that oh my god there's so many like shortcuts that I could not see that were right in front of me but I was so addicted to taking the hard road uh, and yeah that's that has been such a massive realization yeah no it's great I mean sometimes you are you're too in, too involved you're too in the weeds to be able to, you know, go in the helicopter view, so to speak, and have a look. And sometimes you just need to have a conversation with somebody, but you need to have it with an open mind, not judgmental or anything. Just having, I mean, sometimes uh, I, I just have a conversation with my wife or my mum even, uh, and, and they're not really involved in property or anything. So a lot of what I say, they don't really understand, but they, they're they not there to actually give me the answers. They're there for me to listen to what I'm saying. And I normally come up with my own answers just by them asking questions and digging deeper. It's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why didn't I think of that? Well, I probably did, but I was too emotionally attached to the problem. So now I always try and say myself, no problems, only solutions. Because yes, we're going to have problems. I'm not as naive to say that we're not going to have good days and bad days, but it's how I react to those. And I'm totally with you on that one. And that's why a lot of people say, you know, my, my mother still reads a newspaper, physical newspaper. And I, I keep saying, oh, why, why are you reading that, mum? Because she'll, she'll then start talking about, oh, do you know that this is happening? This is happening. I said, yeah, you're telling me all the bad stuff, mum. I'm not bothered. Tell me something good. What, what happened today? How's your garden going? How are you? You know what I mean? Let's let's hear about some good things. Let's not talk about the doom and gloom. Uh, mm. And I think 
press and the news and everything. It's, it, it really does feed people. And people are addicted to bad news because some people love to have the arguments. They love to be in that sort of state. Uh, and I obviously, I just, I just pity that, that sort of thing. But of course, we've gone right off topic and off track when it comes to profit. <laughs> because I think it's so, so, so important. And I, I use it with my students. I bet you use it with your students. It's one of the first things you have to get right. If you can get this right, your head, uh, get your mind right, then you can achieve whatever it is you want to achieve. But if you doubt in yourself all the time, and I expect we can, we can dig into this with investors and things, when you've got your first investors involved, I mean, when I've worked with people and investors, I, I've had, we've all had that little voice because it's new to us. Who am I to get investors money? Who am I to do this? Who am I to do? I've never done this before, you know, or I, I have, but not to this level. And it's, it's sort of having that confidence in yourself, but not bragging, but having the confidence to say, listen, no matter what's going to happen here, whether we get result A, B, or potentially we get down, you know, uh, downgraded in our pricing and things like that, whatever happens, we'll get through it and we'll get through it mm -hmm. together. And I think about working with the right people as well but going back to you know when you when you started using investors money and you were building a portfolio really really quickly and i expect you know 10 deals in 12 months that's that's buying a lot of properties uh in quick succession <laughs> a lot of solicitors a lot of fees a lot of money going around i mean how was that for you uh, it was yeah it was crazy it was um <laughs> but also yeah it was like it's still in that exciting phase um i guess it was yeah it was quite amazing to get people on board and i feel like Dave and I were just so convinced about how amazing property was that actually putting that in front of people is initially like family members um, and just saying like, you know, people who've got money and it's not doing anything. And we were just doing the stuff that was making good money. We were just like, it, there wasn't a lot of doubt in our mind, really. We were just so convinced about what we were doing um of course like there's always that little thing at the back but you know 80 90 percent of us were just like this is amazing and like if we don't bring this to our family and friends we're gonna kind of like zoom off ahead um whilst their money's just like rotting away in the bank so yeah it was um it was crazy but I think that the really important part for that time was we accidentally were very focused <laughs> it was a strategic accident at that point so we but the first deal we did was um, a, a one bedroom flat in Erith in southeast london um uh bought it 108 and a half thousand did about seven and a half grand a refurb uh, and then we, we should have refunded us at 130 but we got a refund us like 125 the first down bell the first tiers of the down bell and um what we then did was like it went but it still went really well like even with the down bell like overall it was still good we got a higher rent than we expected we got a great tenant it was really it was like a good solid little model so we just was like well let's just go and do more of those basically so we just started being really clear within that area like we buy one bedroom flats and we knew how much we could pay. We knew how much they were worth. We knew what the rent was. And so we, that's what we've spoken to our family members who were interested to invest in. So they were like, yeah, cool, we'll do that. So we just went and essentially pretty much just replicated the same thing over and over again in a very quick succession. Like I think we agreed like three within a matter of maybe like a month or something like it was just very quick like we could just spot it we knew it we could act quickly and whereas it had taken me like 12 months before to know if something was right we just knew um so that was very powerful and we just we did that we then evolved um to converting some of the one beds into two beds uh, which is an evolution of the process but then what happened after that was and it's everything has upsides and downsides right like we're going to all these networking events meeting all these amazing people and I start meeting like, you know, these other really cool guys who are doing like rent to rent and they're like renting a property in like 30 days, renting it out to other people and making like a thousand pounds a month. And I'm like, oh my God, it's taking me like four months to buy these properties. And then I'm getting a few hundred pounds a month and I'm having to put all this money down. I'm like, oh my God, clearly I need some rent to rent in my life. Um, and then you meet other people who are doing like title splits and that sounds really sexy. Uh, you meet the cool commercial conversion dude. He's like, I don't get out of bed for less than half a million pounds on a deal. I'm like, what am I doing with my life? Like, why am I you know, farting around these little poxy single lets when there's all of this other stuff? It all sounded better than what we were doing. Um, and so we started trying to do all these different things under this wonderful post-rationalization of 
diversification <laughs> it's just like the creator's uh, brilliant reason to go and do other stuff so we went out and started to try and do all this other stuff we started to meet other investors who wanted to invest in different things and their criteria didn't meet with what we were doing so rather than just saying no we can't invest with you we tried to find deals that would work for that investor and so from going like and doing like 10 deals in 12 months it that focus completely dissipated into complete shiny penny overwhelm and the end result of that was over the next 12 months despite the fact that I'd quit my job I ended up working just as hard in property but we only did one deal that following year right because we lost all that focus and momentum. Um, so that was like such an important learning, which is like, we think diversifying is good because it makes things less risky, but actually what's the risk of trying to diversify? Like there's so much that you don't know. Are we at one point we're looking at like this 18, I think it's like 18 unit commercial conversion, couple of million pounds. We'd only done like a refurb until that point. We had no clue what we were doing. And we're really lucky we had a mentor who was like, guys, no, just don't, you don't know what you don't know. Stick with this and make it, you know, make it work. Um, because actually there's huge risk in trying to do new stuff. And it's a great reason that we tell ourselves that we should, you know, change and do something else. But actually, because you know the risks with what you're currently doing and you know all the downsides, somehow it seems more magnified to you. So it seems worse, but actually that's the best thing because you know what the problems are. So make a plan to overcome those problems and, and keep going and keep doing it. Um, and once we kind of circled back around to finding our focus again, we, we flew. Um, but yeah, it, the, the, that shiny penny is a real killer. And it gets everybody. It gets every. I was exactly the same when I started out. So I'm building a rent to rent business, getting all cash flow. That's all I'm focusing on HMOs. Here we go. Here we go. Next minute, I'm in some pubs. I'm looking at converting pubs into flats and I'm walking and I'm even putting offers in. I've got an investor lined up. I've never done a conversion or anything like that in my life. I thought I'll work it out as I'm going along. Seems like a great idea. Luckily, I didn't actually win. Uh, I lost it by a thousand pound bid, which I didn't even know I, I would have gone a grand up. But I was hell bent on that. And it was actually my wife who watches from the sideline and just sat me down and said, Mark, just focus on one thing. Nail it crush it and then you can go out there and do whatever you like but get this working for you in the background and i think that's so so important i did a podcast episode recently where i said at the end of the day it is a journey so we're all going down this road and of course there's plenty of times that you can sort of take a detour or you can go the other way but what i try and say to people is when you've started out if, it, if it's working for you just keep going down that road for the minute you know, really get those systems built up because I, I'm massive I, and I think you're the same as well. Having those systems, having a business, property has to be set up as a business. Don't have it as a hobby. Even if you want it as a hobby, still set it up as a systemizable, scalable business, whether you want to scale it or not. But I also say a lot of people go down that road. Now, sometimes you can take the pavement. So, you know, for me, if it's rent to rent, I'm doing HMOs. I can get some serviced accommodations in there as well. We've got to put a few new systems in. But it's all along the same lines. But we're not going off and we're trying to do developments or commercial units. That's a completely different road, if you like, for me and a road map to it. So I think what you've got there is finding it out for yourself. Everybody will have this. You will have the shiny pennies. And the grass always seems greener doesn't it when you're listening to people you think to yourself, oh wow that's a dog you can pick those up in a couple of months and i could have like three or, three or five of those rather than this but then yeah, you know this this works for you and it's still going but i mean even from that you've obviously you know you've gone from the flats but you're you're scaling up now you're, you're only investing in in units aren't you so is that blocks of flats yeah it's only blocks of flats so yeah we went from buying leasehold flats to buying blocks of flats taking on the whole freehold and we thought it would be you know it was actually it kind of accidental in a way we were like our area in southeast london i chose it for one of the reasons being that there was good capital appreciation potential the capital appreciation potential came to pass prices went up and then of course yields go down as the prices go up and it just the whole model broke <clears throat> so by that point we were like uh we can we could move area we were free to move so we decided to do a whole big piece of research to the whole of the uk had like seven different criteria that we were looking for in terms of an area, did a load of analysis. And from that, we identified Thanet in Kent by the Kent coast as being a potential similar opportunity to Southeast London, like kind of in that London ripple zone. I really do buy into the London ripple. Um, mm. And 
But I was like, if we just go as far southeast as possible into Kent, cheapest of the home counties, you still benefit from that London ripple. But just go as far as possible so that you're like basically in France. Um, like that's as far as you can go. To ideally have a bit more time because we only had a window of maybe like two years, two and a half years in southeast London before it stopped working. And that's quite a that's quite a short window of time to really grab the opportunity. So I was like, I would like five years, <laughs> five strong years in an area before it changes. Um, ironically, that's what we pretty much ended get up getting up until like the hype of like a year ago when everything was just getting crazy and it started to break in the same way. Stuff is changing actually again now. I think we might get a, a little bit longer out of um, out of Thanet. Um, so yeah, we but we were looking for individual units again. Like we just wanted to do more of that but then we started to see that there was this opportunity to buy blocks of flats and we just thought oh buying a block of flats not that much harder than buying an individual flat let's do that little did we know of all the complexities because you don't know what you don't know um so anyway we went along that journey we learned all the lessons of that um so it was it was still a different business model to doing individual flats there was a lot more to learn but we naively didn't realise that at the time. But yeah, now we've just nailed that. And at least it, it all fits into the same sort of like ongoing management process in terms of like single lets, like the, broadly the tenant types are kind of the same as South East London. So that's at least that fitted in. It was just more the like the valuation side of things, some of the things to do with like planning and um, like utilities and that kind of stuff, which we didn't know. Um, so yeah, that's the, that's the pure focus now. So if you don't mind me asking, What's the best way to try and find a block of flats? Because obviously you go on a right move. You don't often see a block of flats for sale, do you? Is it all commercials um, or? No, they're it, it, a bit of a weird space. You kind of have to, like, they are on right move, but they're not, then no one knows what category to put them in. So you might find them listed as like a 20 bed house or something. So it's just like about figuring out how the agents in whatever area you're in are kind of like, like listing them um for us as well just like building relationships and becoming known for what we do that was the same thing with the single lets like in southeast london just buying flats we were just the people who bought one bedroom flat sounds really basic but you know you're going into an agent saying i want to buy deals they don't know what a deal is so at least give them a sandbox so we would just be like yeah we buy blocks of flats in like belvedere abbey wood and Erith. so anything that comes up let us know and just by being the people that they thought of when that kind of property was there meant we just got called when like chains broke um, and we could just offer quickly and move. So we ended up getting some really great deals where the chain had broken. Like we'd watched them sit on right move for ages. They'd been under offer. Chain broke down. We got they came to us and we agreed the same price that had been agreed like six, nine months prior. Um, so, yeah, just that relationship with agents has been really big. Um, and then subsequently, we've made a bit more of an effort with direct to vendor like getting known with more landlords in in the area you know sending out letters and things so nothing nothing really sexy and shiny and different to what anyone else is doing um just some things pay off quicker than others yeah yeah well it is i mean property as they always say is a people's business so you have to get out there you have to go and shake some hands you're never going to build a property business sat behind a desk because you have got to build up those relationships but again if you're known in the sector as somebody that's always on the lookout and of course with the agents as well when when they're thinking well the landlord wants to say, what the hell am I going to do with this? Well, I tell you what, we know, I uh, remember Jackie, we spoke to Jackie. She's always interested or the prop, or the business is always interested in that. We'll reach out to these people. I suppose that puts you a cut above everybody else out there who's starting out as well because you're more seasoned in what you're doing. But I love the fact that whatever it is you've done, you've nailed. Do you know what I mean? You, you've gone in, you've gone in you've fit, you know, with, with everything, but you've made sure that, you, you know, you get the pitfalls, you master it. And you're not just running around doing the next things as well. So how, how, uh, how's your team looking at the moment? then? Because I'm conscious of the fact that you do love to travel. Obviously, you can work remotely by talking to people and things like that. But there are certain things that uh, you can't do or you can't have done in England while you're in France or traveling around the world. So um, how, how's, the, how's the business looking from your side of things? Yes. So it's actually making me think about it, talking about going around agents <clears throat> and I, one of the problems that I found going around agents was I look about 12 years old. Like, I'm like, hello, can I possibly buy a block of flats from you, please? <laughs> They're like, yeah, yeah, little girl, just like over there. Um, <laughs> so um, I ended up hiring my dad, actually. Um, he he's like he was like retired. But, you know, I was like, oh, he's he's really good with like people. He loves finding a deal. I was like, I wonder if I could get him to like help us to find stuff. Because, you know, like he looks like the property investor that you would expect. Um, so my dad is <clears throat> on the ground in Margate 
okay. these days so he is um like quite often like the face of of the company in terms of like agents just like when you need someone who's got the the face that fits and he's brilliant as well but he just is what you expect he's he's absolutely amazing um and then we also have a maintenance guy on the ground as well um uh, my dad also helps out with like viewings and stuff he's great like that whole people side of it going out and doing viewings um negotiations like anything that's that we get my dad involved for and then we've got a maintenance uh person on the ground as well to deal with like all of those other bits and pieces like keys and stuff as well is um in their remit and then um we have everything else is is in the philippines um so we have um all of our back office side of our lettings is all run there and um, all of our contracts and stuff for like asts etc we do online um if we're doing purchase progression on deals that's done from there as well like anything that's just sitting in front of a computer yeah we've we've built we found a way to find really good people based out in the philippines and we've got an amazing little team all of our accounts stuff is done out of there all of our like bookkeeping financial reports um, integration with um like zero and all that kind of stuff is all done from there so uh there's about eight of them in the philippines that's good that's good i've got three i've got three and a p and a pa and i have to say if i had to lose everything the pa would be the last to go because that's how i know what i'm doing that's my schedule and everything so always put to, to me because i am one of these people i'm here there and everywhere so i just want to look at my calendar and think right i need to be there why because i'm basically being told to be there that's where i've got to show up and i've got to get on with it um, but I, I think that's great. And and of course, you know, as you as you were building this and as you were going through, were you finding it very difficult to incorporate systems and bring people in at the same time? Uh, because I, I often think with property, well, a lot of property investors, including myself, I left it a bit too late until I started actually bringing in people because I wanted all the money or all the profits. I didn't want to start spending out where and that probably cost me a bit of time. In the, well, it certainly did because I was doing everything. Whereas, I, you know, as soon as I started handing things over. My first worry was, what do you hand over? But there's so much to hand over, but you've got it all in your head and you think nobody, well, I was like this, nobody else can do it as well as me and things. But I mean, I think you're a bit more systemized uh, and organized than my good self, that's for sure. So it'd be great to hear your sort of uh, side of it. Yeah, I've been on a real journey with this, actually, because I am very, for one, I'm very bossy, right? Like, I'm, you know, I feel like I'm where I'm meant to be, bossing people around and people pay me money for it because I'm very good at it. So I'm very good at, like, knowing, like, I, that I shouldn't be doing that and telling someone else to do it. And I have no problems with that. So that has been good. Um, I think the journey for me has been that balance between a good amount of organisation and order and chaos. Because I think if you have too much order... And I am generally more that way inclined. I would I'd rather things were neat and tidy and there was a good process for it. Like that's my kind of natural inclination. But if you're too far that way, you can have a lovely organized business that ain't really doing anything. Whereas wow. if you're on the other side, you're in complete chaos. Loads of stuff is happening, but there's no focus. There's no systems. And once you get past a certain point with that, it's very, very hard to come back from it without the whole thing imploding. So I think it, probably between the two of us mark is actually the the right approach to this so you've had to come a bit my way i've had to come a bit your way and that's for me been the real learning is what how best to systemize things that doesn't take too like doesn't take the time like there isn't enough time like we're doing everything right it's a lot to juggle you can't be spending like days and days sitting down writing systems like that you don't have time for that like you've got to do deals and like keep your investors happy and all that other stuff so um for me the kind of learning has been to accept stuff being a little bit messy if it's too tidy and there's not the occasional thing being dropped you're missing an opportunity in terms of like growth um and also i think if you start delegating too soon you just you never catch up with yourself from a cash flow perspective no. like particularly with like um how long it takes to buy property that like a uh, cash conversion cycle from how long it takes to start doing something to money actually coming back out again is so long that if you start, if you don't structure it in the right way and you start delegating too soon, you end up giving all the money that you've created to your team and you're not really making enough money. So like, that's like the thing to be balanced. So for me, the kind of realization having been through it and then having subsequently helped other people to do it is the important thing is more a systemized approach 
rather than systemization. So the systemized approach for me starts with that clear focus about what your model is, what you're doing. So blocks of flats, HMOs, whatever it is, like that being really clear and mm -hmm. therefore everything sort of naturally starts to systemize behind it. Cause you're like, right, I buy blocks of flats in Blackpool. That's what I do. So therefore, okay, th I, this is the spec. This is how many flats have to be in a block for it generally to work. This is how big the units have to be. That's how much I could generally afford to pay them because they're wor worth that, that out the other end. That then informs your sourcing plan. It becomes very easy to communicate what you're doing. It becomes very easy to create an investor proposition to get investors on, on board becomes a lot easier to see if they are interested and you can give them what they want. And if you can't, that's okay too. And then that starts to bring, build a nice investor pipeline process naturally from that. And then same thing with more operational side, like you, you've you got the same kind of tenants all the time. It's the same kind of process to find them, to look after them, to do the maintenance. Like you, you just naturally start doing it consistently the same every time. And even if that's you for a time, like that's totally fine. At first, you've got to make enough money. So you've got to do work, right? Like the cash flow only comes when you've got enough cash flow to pay you and pay other people. So until then, just take the money and do the work. But do it in a way that means when the cash flow is there, the process has been so systemized in terms of how you've done it, you can just sit someone down for half an hour or an hour, explain how your sourcing process works, video it, and ask them to go and write it down and start doing it. And it's just, yeah. it happens so much more easily. And you just keep that balance of cash flow and time and order and chaos, like kind of in the right kind of ballpark. No, that's brilliant. That's, but I, I'm always telling people, you know, if you've got anything that you're doing, data scraping, reference checks, anything like that, just record yourself on a simple system like Loom or something and just upload it. I uploaded mine into the Google Cloud, but I wish I'd done it a lot sooner because all of a sudden you'll start to make your own sort of database of training. And I, the way I looked at it, I just thought to myself, if I become ill uh, and I can't do certain things, at least I can turn around to somebody else and just say, if you look at that file, just copy what I'm doing on that screen there and just do that for me. Obviously, the face to face stuff I have to do. So that was yours. Yours actually, your breakdown is a lot better than mine. Mine was sort of just piecing things together. But I think like exactly what you're saying there, and I'm a massive, but you need a business first to systemize. There's no point in going in and because a lot of people always do the old expression, gotta have me ducks in a line, gotta have all my ducks in a row. Yes. You know what I mean? It's like, you haven't got a business to have any ducks yet. Go out there and get some deals. I've seen some people with loads of ducks all lined up and they have hardly any cash flow. <laughs> so get exactly. rid of the ducks. <laughs> yeah, forget the ducks. Yeah, look for the opportunities. <laughs> look look for what you, what you want and the opportunities that are there and then worry about the ducks afterwards. Worry about the ducks when you've got money in there and you're not worrying about the money so much do you know what i mean um, like you can yeah, do that with a focused intention around like what sort of deals that you're doing it's it's yeah. never going to get so mental that you can't come back again so like as long as you're not going like oh i'm doing hmos oh but maybe i'll do this block of flats and maybe i'll look at that development like it's it's not game over but you're losing lives when you get into like starting to do that if you can just keep with one focus you're never going to get so far from yeah you're not going to get to complete chaos no, that's it. And I think it starts at the beginning. You know, you've got to ask yourself, a lot of people say to me, well, I'm thinking of doing this strategy or that strategy or getting into doing this. And I always say, what do you need? What do you need right now? What do you want right now? If you try and do something that's too far down the line and it's not exactly what you're focusing on, what you need now, you'll stop because you will get to the point where you say, hang on a minute, these commercial conversions are brilliant, but I'm not getting paid. Do you know what I mean? Until, you know, 12, 18 months down the line and I need cash flow now. So, Start with the cash flow or, or what you need now in mind. If you've still got a job and you're happy to do it alongside a job or you've still got money coming in, then you can do those things. But yeah, always start with, with what you need because it will keep you going, keep sharpening your pencil. Um, and, and that's what it is. I am conscious of your time and everything, but I do like to ask a few questions at the end. I could talk to you all day long because uh, it's just brilliant. I really, it's really enjoy it. All right. it's, I call it a quick fire round. It's not really. You can have a little think about things and stuff like that. But it's just questions I like to ask people because I'm interested in the answers. So if that's all right with you, I'll ask you a few questions. Do it. Okay, brilliant. What's the best advice you've been given? Ever. Well, it, it could be ever, it could be recently. It could just be something that you think, oh, yeah, I, I resonate with that. Um, I think for me, it wasn't necessarily one moment in time. It's been accumulation of kind of learnings and lessons from people. It's that I am self-sabotaging. We are all self-sabotaging. 
Like I didn't think I was someone who self-sabotaged. I thought I, um, I, you know, I built this whole business. How can I be self-sabotaging? I want to do something, I go out and do it. But I didn't realize how much my subconscious was really ruling the show and how actually there's so much that I wasn't consciously aware of that I was doing that was holding me back um, from, from being able to move forward more quickly. So I think for me that, that so therefore the piece of advice would be uh, everyone self-sabotages, but you have to be able to shine the light on what your version of it is. And I think it changes and evolves over time and there's lots of layers to it. Um, but yeah, f- finding finding out what my versions of that were, for example, like like perfectionism, like worrying about what other people think and those things really driving the show. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. That's quite deep, that. I like that. It is, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it's one of those things where you could look at what you're doing and say, I've been busy all day, but have you have you really been busy on the right things? Because a lot of us get comfortable, don't we? We're on we're on right route, we're on Zoopla. It's, I'm looking for deals, I'm looking for deals. I'm busy, I'm, I'm trying to find deals. No, 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 you need to get out there and start talking to people, shaking hands, you know what I mean? That sort mm. of thing, as well as it. So I think that's brilliant. I think we, yeah, we definitely can all look deeper at what we do. And I get to the end of the day and I do a little review when I finish, most days if I'm in the office and things. I say, have I been productive today? And I generally try and be honest with myself. And sometimes I'll get there and I'll just think, I have been, but I haven't really been. Do you know, I I think I could have done more. So it's like, well, okay, Mm. don't give me hard time for it. How can I make sure that I don't do that again? Because it can become a habit, can't it? Absolutely. Yeah, how can I, yeah, what am I not doing? Because I don't want to look at it. That's actually the thing that would make the biggest difference. That if I could just look at that part of myself that feels uncomfortable, I could go through that, go into it and realize that actually just make that phone call or just write that thing or whatever it is, that if that was the only thing that you'd done that day and you worked one hour, you'd have had far better results from that one thing. But you just have to look at the scary part of yourself first. <laughs> That's the scary part, the fearful part or the worrying part. Normally, if you take action on those, those are the things that will move you forward the quickest. Uh, and that is so, so, so true. So, so, so true. Wow, that was that was a good answer. That was probably the best answer I've had on that question. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you could sit down and have uh, dinner with three people, dead or alive, uh, could be anybody, it doesn't have to be property related, anybody like that, who would you like to sit down and have a chat with? So the first person that comes to mind is Michael Singer. Um, he wrote a book called The Surrender Experiment, which is like totally informing my whole direction of life at the moment. If you haven't heard of it, check it out. It's amazing. So Michael Singer, I would probably also say, I think Joe Dispenza would be there right now. Like he's been such a big influence on us. And I just love her. Karen Brady. Just I love that woman. I just think she's like, I think she's like got a really good heart, but she's got a good little you just don't want to mess with her. I, I've, I've just always oh, quite liked that woman. Oh. <laughs> yeah. No, that's good. that's good. Michael Singer, didn't he do Untethered Soul as well? Yeah, amazing Quality. book. Quality. I haven't heard of the other one, so I'll uh, I'll have a look at that. But uh, yeah, uh, that Untethered Soul was a game changer for me. That was one of those real. Mm. I got it. I read it, and I got the audio book, and I've just gone through it quite a few times. Brilliant stuff. That'd be good conversations yeah. there. Um, Definitely. Do you listen to podcasts? If you do, do you have three uh, podcasts that you enjoy? My favourite podcast is uh, one called Bliss and Grit, um, which is kind of like we're touching on a lot of the subjects here. Kind of, it's they're on the the path of like becoming more aware and like kind of realizing where they're self sabotaging. Um, so that one I really love. I actually really love also the. Um, the Duolingo podcast. I'm currently learning French, so I love sitting along, driving the van, uh, and listen to the Duolingo podcast. And is there another? Then, apart from that, I kind of like these random ones that come up that are more like. Um, I love the one that was about the. Uh, there was like a big fraud in the states with that like uh, oh well like the we work thing there was like a whole thing where like how that imploded and like the investigation behind it so i kind of like enjoy these like random story ones where there's like a lot of intrigue and stuff going on underneath the surface that you wouldn't expect well that sounds good that sounds i like I, one i've caught onto recently is called business wars and it goes back through the history of all different, like McDonald's and Burger King and, and Tesla and Ford and all of those sort of things. And it, it goes in like a story mode. And I find those quite entertaining mm-hmm. when I just want to listen to something a bit different. So that's good. That's good. Uh, you've also got a podcast coming out yourself, haven't you? 
Yeah, it's crazy. Um, yeah, next week, the 12th of July, we're actually launching our podcast. This podcast is called Property Lifestyle Mastery. It's all about building that property business that can run without you, how you travel the world and your property business can still work without you. And then linking into all these different areas about like business strategy, raising finance, productivity. Um, so yeah, and very much similar in style to what we've done here, right? Like just having conversations. It's not like really edited or like, you know, we fluff up and we cut it out. It's just open, honest conversations, talking about the shit as well as the as the good stuff. Um, so yeah, that's launching next week. So um, yeah, please, I'll, put, I'll share the link here to uh, to come over and, and subscribe um I'm, I'm really excited for it to come out and start consistently having conversations like this with um my business partner dave like the stuff that we're talking about in our living room i'm just gonna like start we're just starting to like you know hit record and record the conversations that we're having um because i think that'll be really beneficial for other people to, to listen to um just to like be part of you know sitting and i'll have fly on the wall and having a coffee with us essentially um is the plan so yeah 12th of july that's that's launching so um yeah come and subscribe and see what you think that sounds brilliant sounds but i certainly will be i'm uh, very interested uh no that sounds great and yep yeah, we'll put the links in the show notes so that anybody can go out along and listen to you and support you and uh yeah highly looking forward to that now this is one of my favorite questions what's your top three books oh my god there's so many books definitely the <laughs> surrender experiment is definitely up there um <clears throat> Oh, it's just so it's interesting, like the different periods of time. I'm going to answer this for myself right now. Obviously, you've asked me this a few years ago. It would have been different. Um, the Surrender Experiment by Michael Singer. Supernatural by Joe Dispenza. Oh. And I've recently read something that's called Love Money. Money Loves You. Um, and it's like if you're kind of we're obviously touching on like laws of the universe like everything is energy if you kind of listen to me say those things and you think that's like something that intrigues you then you should check it out it's a, a lady um lady who wrote it her business failed and so she was like she lost everything and she was in a really dark place and she kind of was for some reason drawn to start writing she started writing and she didn't know where it was coming from just didn't make sense it wasn't knowledge that she thought that she had um, and she realized she was basically channeling the energy of money um so money was talking through her and it was the it uh, yeah she just wrote it all down as so that's what's in this book and it is just it makes so much sense um and just the perspective shifts on on money and how we think about things uh, in that book is just solidified um and made me very excited by a lot of stuff that we've kind of been touching on um but yeah just taking that one step further oh amazing amazing i like that as well because that's three books that i hadn't really heard of as well so it, it adds to my library it goes onto my list and i get those ordered awesome. so, uh, thank you for that because a lot of people when we're starting out we're all pretty much you know in a similar boat we we tend to read the same sort of books we all say the same sort of thing because they are the books that have got us there but i like it when people are further down the road because you see things you see life at a different perspective don't you you know the old you is, is past and gone we're always trying to improve ourselves so by moving into those new you sort of digging deeper into things and I'm, I'm massive on you know psychology and spirituality and things like that because I, I very much believe you know the better I can be myself the the better things will happen in my life uh, and a better I can better husband I can be better father I can be and all of those things and that's that's as much as what I strive to do as well as building you know and growing my property businesses and, and other businesses as well so and I can see the same in you as well which is great it's really nice and I think for me I thought that year in property, that first 18 months that we were speaking about earlier, that like kind of excitement, I kind of was like, I thought that that phase was gone. But for me, coming into all of these kind of these books that I've sort of suggested there, it's made me realise that it's reignited that excitement for life in a whole new way and, and a whole new way for property um, yeah. and, and like the strategy and mentoring stuff that we do as well. So, um, so yeah, it's been uh, absolutely life changing. Absolutely brilliant. Well, I'd like to thank you for joining me today. It's been a great interview. I knew it would be. Uh, uh, and an much. absolute joy to talk to you. If anybody wants to reach out to you to find out more about what you're up to or your coaching or your podcast or anything, what's the best way to do that? Uh, go and check out our website. It's the best way. If you go to uh, property-strategy.com, um, you can reach out and send me a message through there. Social media links are on there. If you want to subscribe to the podcast, um, that is on there as well. So, yeah, that's that's a good hub to go to and, you know, explore it and connect however works best for you.
Brilliant, brilliant. And have you got any final thoughts before we wrap this one up? I think property is absolutely amazing, but it is hard and there are many uh, tough moments along the way, but don't give up and just realise that the, the toughest moments are actually the most important moments and you will grow the most. So don't give up um, and keep going and just keep keep learning. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Well, thank you once again. It's been great to have you on. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you have, please like, follow, subscribe, share it, tag me into any of the posts and things, but also make sure that you know what it is that you want to achieve, that you've got down, nailed your vision. You can chase it by hitting your goals and you can create the life that you desire. I hope you'll all enjoy this episode and will come and join me for the next episode soon. You all take care and bye for now.